What's going on? He needs to talk to you. Found it looks like it uh, turns out to be a fatality. Looks like it might have been a robbery gone wrong. Do you think he wanted to harm your husband? Or did no. he, was he worried about anything? I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I met him once. From a young age, it was obvious that Valerie McDaniel would go far. She graduated top of her class in high school and was a valet dictorian in college. Valerie had always harbored a great love for animals. And so she decided to turn this passion into a career by becoming a veterinarian. Valerie opened her own clinic along with her husband Mac and the enterprise soon proved to be a money spinner. Thanks in no small part to Follery's affable nature and extraordinary expertise. Follery's life was just about perfect. The only thing missing was a child. However, Follery learned that she was unable to have children and so she and Mac adopted a daughter in 2008. The future appeared to be very bright indeed for Follery. But that would all change one day when Follery was at work and received a phone call from a woman claiming that she had been sleeping with her husband. In fact, the woman on the other end of the line was able to give Follery a whole list of women whom her husband had been sleeping with. Follery confronted Mac and he admitted that he had indeed been cheating on her. Follery was devastated but not surprised. She had long suspected her husband of being unfaithful. The couple would try to salvage their marriage, but when Follery caught Mac cheating yet again, she knew that her 17 year marriage was over and the couple filed for divorce. They agreed to share custody of their daughter, who was by now nine years old. Shortly thereafter, Follery crossed paths with Leon Jacob, who was the son of a neighbor. The encounter wasn't exactly love at first sight. Follery found Leon to be brash, boastful and insufferably arrogant. But the course of true love never did one smooth and eventually Follery and Leon commenced a whirlwind romance. By early 2017, Leon was living with Follery and her daughter in her apartment. From Follery's point of view, Leon was a successful young doctor but the truth was something very different. Leon had graduated from a medical school on the Caribbean island of Grenada, but to say that his medical career had never really taken off would be something of an understatement. Most doctors will only ever complete one residency program. Leon Jacob had been kicked off from six since his graduation in 2005. He alienated teachers and classmates alike with his pompous know-it-all attitude and his bedside manner also left a lot to be desired. Leon could be rude and insulting to patients but there were also occasions where his incompetence put their lives in danger. Naturally once the patient's health was deemed to be at risk with him on the ward officials were not slow in showing Leon the door. Like Valerie, Leon was a divorcee and he had two sons from a previous marriage. Leon had met Annie in college and the two were married for 12 years. Annie would eventually divorce Leon, explaining that he was an emotional and physical bully. Talk to me about during that time period when you're, you were pregnant with your younger son, was he violent with you? Yes, he was. Okay, tell me about that. It was much of the same, um, pushing, um, grabbing me, there was one time he pushed my head down onto the counter and, and bruised my face near my eye. Did he ever threaten you? Yes. Okay, tell me about that. Um, he threatened that if I ever left, that he would kill me. He said that nobody would ever find my body because he was a doctor and he had access to chemicals that would, that would dissolve my body. After his divorce from Annie, Leon moved to Pittsburgh 
to attend one of his numerous doctor's residencies. There, he met 33-year-old Megan Farrakis. At first, Leon was a wonderful boyfriend to Megan. After Leon was kicked off his residency program, Megan agreed to move to Texas with him so that he could enroll in yet another program, this time in Houston. Eventually, Leon subjected Megan to the same treatment he had dished out to his ex-wife. He would often smugly point out to her that she was uneducated and poor. When Leon's abuse became physical, Megan eventually ended the three-year relationship. However, just as he had done after his divorce from his ex-wife, Leon struggled to move on. He began to stalk and harass Megan. After an incident at her workplace, Megan went to the police and Leon was charged with stalking her. Now remember, at this point, Leon is living with Valerie and the two are even talking about getting married. But it's obvious that Leon desperately wants to get back with Megan. Leon was also still holding on to the dream of becoming a doctor. But Megan pressing charges threatened to derail that ambition also. If he were to be found guilty, Leon would be unable to obtain a medical license. In the end, Leon felt that he was backed into a corner. He somehow came into contact with a US Army veteran named Sack. Sack had seen combat during his military career and was a recipient of the Purple Heart. In exchange for murdering Megan, he accepted $5,000 in cash, two luxury watches and a laptop. However, Sack had no intention of carrying out the murder. He was a con man, not a hitman. After receiving his down payment from Leon, Sack disappeared. Following his arrest for stalking Megan, Leon had used bail bondsman Michael Kubosh to post his bail money. Leon approached Kubosh once more and asked him to track down the mysterious Sack character. However, when Kubosh asked Leon just why he was so desperate to find Sack, he was stunned when Leon said, I've paid him a lot of money to take care of this mother. I want her out of the picture. Michael Kubosh would later say that the encounter was like talking to the devil. Kubosh raised his suspicions with Houston police and they were concerned enough to immediately contact Megan and move her to a safe house while Leigh got to work on tracking down the man who had supposedly been paid to take her life. Houston police eventually did find Sack, whose real name turned out to be Moataz Aseh. While being interrogated, Moataz confessed that he had accepted payment from Leon in return for murdering Megan, but he was adamant that he had no real intention of harming anybody. He told detectives that the way he saw it, Leon was a real dirtbag, and by accepting the bounty he had placed on Megan, Moataz had probably saved her life. In the end, detectives decided to use Moataz as an asset. Moataz reopened contact with Leon and told him that he had found a third party who would be able to carry out the hit on Megan. Leon spoke with this person on the phone, a man by the name of Javier. Of course, Javier was no hitman. He was an undercover police officer working out of the Houston Police Department. As Javier spoke with Leon, officers were listening to every word. They were stunned to hear Jacob say the following. We're taking care of both problems. Both of the individuals that we're talking about. Up until this point, detectives had assumed that Leon was only trying to have his ex-girlfriend murdered. But it now transpired that there was a second individual whom he wanted to get rid of. That person, Maureen McDaniel, the ex-husband of his current girlfriend, Valerie. Leon wanted to meet Javier in person to discuss the finer details of the plot. And to that end, they arranged a get-together at a local Olive Garden restaurant. A police surveillance team watched in disbelief as Valerie McDaniel and Leon Jacob entered the restaurant. Inside, they had dinner with both Sack and Javier, unaware that detectives from Houston Police Department were listening to their every word. 
Leon got right down to business, suggesting that Javier could possibly kill Megan by injecting her with potassium chloride, the same chemical used in lethal injections. At one point, Leon stepped outside for a cigarette with Sec, leaving Javier alone with Valerie. Javier asked Valerie if she was absolutely sure that she wanted to go ahead with the murder of her ex-husband, Marion. Valerie replied, I have no other choice. He's gonna take my baby away from me. While Valerie and Marion's divorce had been civil enough, their amicable relationship soared after Leon moved in with Valerie and their daughter. Marion just got bad vibes from Leon and he didn't want him anywhere near his only child. Valerie was worried that with Leon's checkered past and upcoming court case, Marion might succeed in obtaining custody of their daughter. Valerie also had a strong financial incentive to get rid of Marion. As part of their divorce settlement, she had agreed to pay her ex $1 million for his share of their fat clinic. Valerie had grown used to the finer things in life. Perhaps she wasn't willing to give up the luxurious lifestyle she had grown accustomed to. Javier suggested that he hijack Marion's car and then kill him with a gunshot to the head. The idea being that Marion's death would look like a robbery gone wrong and not a targeted execution. Valerie agreed. The next day, Javier showed up at Valerie's apartment and showed the pair a photograph of Morian's dead body. The hit on Valerie's axe had supposedly been carried out. That evening, Javier sent Leon photographs of Megan bound and gagged. Javier stated that he had kidnapped and murdered Megan as they had arranged. At 3 a.m. the next morning, Houston police arrived at Valerie's place to break the news of her ex-husband's murder. While Leon and Valerie were doing their best to act gobsmacked at the news of Marion's death, the police officers decided to end the facade. Now we're going to read you your rights. Me? Because both of you have been arrested for oh, solicitation of Captain Murder. What? Well, why? Solicitation of Murder. We have been ordered to remain silent. I want it. Marion McDaniel was alive and well, as was Leon's ex girlfriend, Megan. Both had agreed to assist Houston police to sneer their would be assassins. The photographs were fakes, with pig's blood being used in Marion's images to give the impression that he had been shot in the head. Having believed her ex-husband to have been dead for almost 24 hours, Valerie must have been beside herself when the officers informed her that he was standing out in the foyer. Now that Valerie was under arrest, somebody had to look after her daughter. She was told to go and get the child and hand her over to Marion. Valerie was an intelligent woman, and the irony of the situation wouldn't have been lost on her. She had initiated the hit on Marion to avoid him obtaining custody of their child. But in the end, it was her attempt to have her ex-husband murdered that led to Marion obtaining custody. Valerie would never see her daughter again. Valerie and Leon both arrived in court for a bail hearing. Leon's application was denied, but Valerie was released on a $50,000 bond. Two weeks later, she made the following audio recording on her tablet, stating that she never wanted to hurt Morian. Okay, March 25th, it's been a few days. I, I hope I don't repeat myself. Chad told me later that he was going to try to help me, that he would try to get Matt to leave me alone. And uh, at the same time, he was was working to try to get Megan to go back to Pittsburgh. It's weird, things, it wasn't like bam, 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 progression, things just gradually happened. There was talk all the time about this, and it just normalized things. It's just so strange, it's hard to explain, but 
talking about somebody trying to, to quiet Mac, make him leave me alone, just became like, oh, okay, this is, that's normal. <laughs> In retrospect, not so normal. I didn't want to hurt Mac, I never did. I'm so sorry about everything. Okay. Thank you for listening. Valerie ultimately decided to take her own life by jumping from her 7th floor balcony. She was killed instantly. Valerie's friends and co-workers were stunned. Valerie hired me straight out of vet school in uh, 01. <laughs> so she uh, really taught me a lot. Sir. And uh, she was not only a mentor but a great, great friend of mine. And she was always willing to help me do whatever I needed to continue to follow my passion, which is veterinary medicine. Meanwhile, Leon's trial got underway. After pathetically trying to argue that he never wanted to harm Megan and that Fallery was solely responsible for putting out the hit on Marion, a jury found Leon guilty of two counts of solicitation of capital murder. After being sentenced to life in prison, Megan was allowed to address Leon in a victim impact statement. You may. and you convinced me it was awful. You manipulated me to leave my family in the life I had. I believe everything happens for a reason. While you sit in jail, I hope you think of me, the girl that you called poor and uneducated. Because it's because of me, you will be in prison for life. You will never see your children grow up. You will not be a part of their lives and they will be better for it. I think some part of me always knew that you would try to hurt me and that you were always lying. The realization that your family also knew you were lying made it be even harder to face this. You destroyed me financially and took away my sense of security, but you can do that no more. Enjoy life in prison. All right, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll go with the bailiff back to the jury room, I'll be back in a moment to hand out your work excuses and release you from further service. Thank you. All rise. And so ended one of the most bizarre criminal cases of recent times. What very easily could have been a double murder instead ended with the would-be culprits dead and behind bars. While Leon Jacob was a natural born dirtbag, an adulterous husband, an absentee father and an all round narcissistic leech, it's hard to fathom just how Valerie McDaniel allowed herself to get involved in a plot to kill a man she had once been in love with. By all accounts she was about as decent a person as anybody could ever hope to meet. She was warm, friendly and generous. There didn't seem to be a bad bone in her body. And now that I have finished researching the case, one question keeps popping up in my mind. What do we really know about the people in our lives? <laughs>